Hey yo, this is Mr. Horton, also known as Bow Tie Guy. We are going to talk about the Nez Purse today. The Nez Purse are one of the, and they are because they're still around. Some of y'all have to get it through your heads just because we're talking about the Native American tribes of the United States in fourth grade social studies in the state of Georgia doesn't mean that they just fluttered off into outer space. No, they still, they're still around. So we're going to talk today about four specific things dealing with the Nez Perce. First, dealing with the food, the clothing, the shelter, and the location. If we can talk about those and if you can try to write something down or uh, do an activity uh, that your teacher will have you do to follow up with this lesson, you have mastered the fourth grade social studies standard that says you can locate this Native American tribe and you can explain how they use their environment to get their food, clothing, and shelter. Get it? Got it? Good. Thank you. Okay, first and foremost, let's talk about the Nez Perce. Who were they? Where did they live? First and foremost, they did not refer to themselves as a Nez Perce. They referred to themselves as Nimpu, which is another name for we the people. Wait a second. I've heard of that somewhere. That's right, in our Constitution, we the people. Uh, and so um, they uh, were given the name Nez Perce by the French, which means pierced nose. Yeah, pierced nose, because they noticed that some of the Nez Perce Native Americans actually had their nose their noses pierced. So let's go ahead and get on with the food, okay? Because that's what we all love. Mr. Horton loves some KFC, some fried chicken. I love all kinds of stuff. But if we're not talking about me, we're talking about the Nez Perce. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to business. All right, the food. What kinds of food did the Nez Perce eat? Okay, well, they first we have to talk about their environment. What kind of environment did they live in? Well, they lived in the plateau. I don't know if you know what a plateau is, but a plateau is flat country. It's high. Okay, so some of the things that they saw, they did not see, in, or you can't see in other uh, parts of the United States. So some of the things I'm going to mention, you may not find in the state of Georgia. Okay, let's talk about the first uh, part of food that they found. Okay, this they had in common with many of the other Native American tribes. They would rummage for what they had available. Berries, all kinds of different berries. And they would use berries for all kinds of different uses. They would use them for pigment. Pigment is something that they put in paint. They would paint things with berries that they found. Uh, they would put them in other meals. They would add them to meals that they already cooked. Uh, and then they'd use them to season things if they needed to, to sweeten things, because uh, most berries are very sweet. So um, they would also use uh, the roots, and I'm gonna talk about roots, just like other Native Americans, uh, they use their environment. They use what they had. So they had lots and lots of roots uh, uh, and bulbs. A bulb is a, uh, another type of root. Uh, but they had berries, roots, bulbs, and they would use those and cook those. Have you ever had a sweet potato? Okay, yeah. One of the, uh, one of the, the, the roots they actually cooked uh, tasted a lot like a sweet potato. Kamas. Kamas uh, was a type of root uh, that when they would uh, boil it or, or uh, cook it, uh, had the taste of a sweet potato, and they would uh, use that often, okay? Now, since they lived in the high country, they had many different types of land animals. This was one of them. This is the elk, okay? Elk were plentiful in the area. There were a good many bit of elk, so they would hunt these usually with spears, um, and uh, later on with horses, uh, but that was l way in the future. Uh, and so they would use the elk, and now just like all the other Native American tribes, they appreciated the land that they uh, lived on, uh, and they respected it, which means that they didn't just kill this and just take the meat and leave the rest. No, they used every bit of the elk for common uses. They would use the antlers that you see right here for tools, uh, and they would use bones for different types of tools. Uh, they would use the fur for their clothing that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, but the meat is what, you know, sustained them, kept them alive, gave them the protein that they needed to survive. But as you can see, there's many different parts of an elk, and you better believe it. They used every bit of the elk for their own use. They used their environment, folks. Okay, elk. Okay. 
Now, something else that was uh, quite plentiful and something that we can find here in the state of Georgia is the, let's see, let's see if you've ever seen one of these. That's right, deer. Some of y'all get real happy about deer season, deer hunting season. Whereas, you know, we may only take the meat and, you know, and whatever happens with the fur, eh, whatever. No, these Native Americans even used the, the skin, the fur, they used everything uh, for their own good. They used the fur and skin for uh, clothing. Like I said with the uh, elk, they used the bones for tools. Uh, and the antlers, you know, they would use for, you know, to, they would sharpen them and then they would use those to help them in other, uh, many other uh, amenities that they needed. Uh, but the deer was very plentiful. Uh, and like I said, they would have to be very uh, stealthful uh, and quick uh, to capture the deer because the deer is mighty, mighty quick. Uh, and so it would gallop off. Uh, and there were actually antelope in the area as well. And you're thinking, antelope? I thought they were only in Africa. No, there were North American antelope. They looked familiar, uh, looked very similar to the uh, deer, but uh, they were in the plateau, the high country. Okie dokie. Now, here's where things get really scary, okay? Now, you may be thinking to yourself, uh-oh, you know, what in the world is this dude talking about? Well, one thing that they uh, would hunt that was also in the area, not as plentiful as the deer and uh, the elk, was the bear, okay? Uh, black bear, all right? Now, uh, and there were many different types of bear as well. The bear uh, was something that, you know, if you weren't careful, it could cause great harm to the Nez Perce tribe uh, or people that were hunting them. So they had to be very, very careful when hunting this bear. But the bear supplied them with, just like what I talked about with the uh, the berries, the the uh, the caribou and the or the elk and the deer. Uh, the bear supplied them with fur, skin, the bones they used for tool, meat. Uh, even though the meat was a little bit more greasy, uh, more fatty than the others, uh, the other types of meat were real lean. Uh, so they didn't have a lot of fat. Uh, but this right here uh, was something that they would find from time to time. They would hunt the bear and then they would kill the bear, use parts of the bear to help their daily lives. Okay. All right, here's the bear. All right, next. All right, birds. Just like with every other Native American tribe, birds were a part of their diet. Near the rivers, they would have duck uh, and uh, geese and different types of birds. This is one, uh, this is a duck that they would find near the river. And just like I said with the others, ducks have feathers, bear has fur, fur, fur. Uh, and but what they would use from the duck would be the feathers. They would use the feathers for uh, ornaments, for decorations, and uh, they would use, like I said, every part of the duck for their own good. They would use their environment, folks. We'll put the duck right here. Okay, now mountain sheep, mountain sheep. You may be thinking to yourself, sheep, like ah, uh, maybe that's a good. One. But anyways, uh, mountain sheep. Uh, they only could be found in the high country. Uh, you can tell by their horns. This looks like a ram, uh, but uh, mountain sheep uh, were another type of animal that they would find, and they would use every part of it. The fur, bones, uh, the, the, the part. Now, these are some heavy-duty uh, antlers, horns right here, and they would use those. They'd grind them down. They would uh, sharpen them. They would use them for anything they could. Folks, just like, and I may be repeating myself, but I just want to get it through your heads. They used their environment. They used what they had. Native Americans, especially the Nez Perce, were experts in utilizing their natural resources. Okay? Next, let's talk about clothing. And things may get a little bit awkward because, do uh, you think about clothing? This old guy's wearing a shirt, you're wearing a shirt. Some of the men didn't wear shirts all the time. The women usually did, they, wear, they wore a type of uh, dress, but we're gonna talk about that in just a minute, okay? Speaking of uh, shirts, thank goodness, um, buckskin. You know, uh, you may be thinking to yourself, hey, I've heard of the word buck and, and buckskin. Well, buckskin, um, you know, came from your deer, and they would make buckskin shirts. And these, they would usually wear when it was colder because in the high country, um, in the plateau area, in the, in the northwest part of the United States, it would get cold in the winter. In the, in the late fall, it would begin to get really cold as well. And so they would use this um, to keep themselves warm. Um, 
and you know they would use the resources that they had. So a buckskin shirt could be found on your men and your boys when it was cold, not all the time, okay? Now, uh, your women, they wore robes and dresses made out of buckskin, made out of fur, whatever they had available at the time. But you can see this lady right here, this lady is wearing a robe. Uh, she's wearing uh, what looks like kind of sort of a dress. Uh, but like I said, they use what they have. They use the resources that they had. And uh, this may be skin fur. I'm not even sure of which animal, but you have to know it. it they utilized what they had. So when they went hunting, um, you know, they used the skin fur for, um, you know, for the protection. They needed clothing. They used their environment, folks. Okay, so let's put this lady right here. All right, now, <clears throat> as you can see in this next picture, take a very good look. All right. These, uh, these look like kids or maybe like teenagers. You see that they're uh, wearing breech cloths and clouts. Um, and you see that, you know, things get a little bit awkward. But look, when it's hot, uh, you, know, you know, in the summertime, we typically wear shorts, t-shirts, things that help us stay cool. Well, so do they. Uh, they wore uh, breech cloths, which are pants. You see this dude right here, this guy? Okay, he's wearing pants that were, uh, were kind of like leggings. And girls, you know what leggings are. And boys, and if you don't, ask a girl and they'll tell you what leggings are. Well, the leggings were, you know, utilized to help, you know, keep the brush and uh, briars and things like that off their legs. Uh, and so, you know, they used what they had to protect themselves, to stay smart. Okay, so this is um, what you would find many of the boys or men wearing. I hope it's not too awkward for you. <laughs> okay, sorry, awkward. All right, next up, last thing. How in the world do they protect their feet? Okay, because you and I, you know, we have real weak feet. Unless you run around barefoot all the time, then you have those tough feet that are really cool. But moccasins were created, um, you know, as a necessity because they needed to protect their feet. Uh, you know, the ground could be rocky, there could be briars, there could be all kinds of uh, dangers that could injure their feet. So they had to keep their feet covered at all times. So what they would use, they would use uh, moccasins. They would, and the moccasins were created from deer skin, uh, elk skin, um, you know, fur if they had to in the wintertime to keep their legs warm, their feet warm. They used what they had. So this, um, or these are moccasins, okay? Next up, let's talk about shelter, okay? I'm gonna put two letters up here and they both stand for something, so I want you to pay very, very close attention. All right, P and S, or T. Let's try T, okay? Sorry about that. P stands for permanent, okay? Permanent shelter. Do you know what permanent means? Permanent means that's something that you live, you know, that's what the Nez Perce lived in for long periods of time. Okay, they didn't just, uh, this is what, you know, you can tell by the design of the house, the shelter, that, you know, they lived in this place for a long time, and it took a long time for them to build this. Uh, so this right here is called a long house, and you can see that it's made out of a lot of different natural resources that they had. Uh, uh, bark, uh, you know, limbs, uh, you know, there were trees in the area, so they utilized what they had, but you can tell that, you know, this took a lot of time to construct. And so this would, was a permanent home that could, you know, house them in the wintertime and keep them safe from the elements if it were to snow, if it were to rain. Uh, and just like animals, uh, just like, you know, you and I looking at each other right now, when it rains, we need a place to go uh, to keep us safe. Because if we just stayed out in the rain all the time, we'd get sick and then we would cease to exist. Well, they needed to build a permanent shelter that would protect them from the elements. This is called a longhouse. The Nez Perce lived in longhouses permanently okay now sometimes from time to time what they would do they would go hunting uh whether it were for uh you know for berries looking rummaging whether it for elk uh for deer bear uh you know your your, your mountain goats or sheep and your duck they would hunt and so when they would hunt, they would need something very temporary for them, like a temporary shelter, because they would wander far from where their permanent homes were. And so if they were, you know, if they hunted all day and they needed a place to stay, they would build this little doodad. This is called a teepee. This is probably one of the most common forms of Native American shelter. Um, it was very, very simple to put up. 
Now you can clearly look at the, right above the TP, right up there, the longhouse, a lot more design uh, involved, a lot more time dedicated to building it. TP could be thrown up within an hour, two hours. It's simple. Uh, they just had a big, uh, a large uh, sheet. Uh, well, it's not really a sheet. It's just a big piece of skin, uh, deer skin or whatever they had. Then they would uh, tie it over and it would make some sort of a cone. They'd have usually have a hole at the top so they could build some sort of fire in the middle. The smoke would rise and then it'd help with uh, ventilation as well. So it would keep the air flowing through the teepee and it's something that they could take down you know, immediately if they needed to. Uh, if they needed to move on or if they're moving quickly for the hunt, uh, they could build a teepee. So a teepee uh, was known as a temporary shelter for the Nez Perce Native Americans. But don't be confused, it was not their permanent shelter because if it were to snow and they were living in this, they wouldn't have fared so well for so long. Okay, that, my friends, is a teepee. Now, let's talk about location, okay? The... And this is my little handy dandy globe. Let's zoom in, okay? What we have right here, we have, this is the United States, okay? We live about here. There's Florida right there. The Nez Perce lived right up here in the high country near Canada, but right below the border. So they lived in three states, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. You can see in this illustration, where it's gray, that is where the Native American uh, tribe known as the Nez Perce lived. Uh, this is high country. The elevation was high, and it was high because they lived uh, near the Rocky Mountains, in the Rocky Mountains, throughout the Rocky Mountains, and, the, and the, it was really high in, that, in this area, okay? And so, uh, now, the uh, Nez Perce were west of the Pawnee, and the Pawnee lived in flat plains, the Great Plains. But you can, but as they moved uh, west, the elevation grew. It was higher and higher, and so the Rocky Mountains, uh, you know, posed many obstacles uh, and changed the environment that Native Americans lived in. And the Nez Perce, you know, adapted to their environment. And then many of the animals that they hunted, many of the uh, the berries that they found, uh, you know were part of the environment that they lived in. So um, they lived in three, these three particular states right here, and I'll throw these up, and I'm gonna show you in just a second where in relation to the United States they lived, okay? So let me get this up. So just, just a reminder, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, that's where they lived about, okay? On our globe, northern northwest part of the united states so we'll put this up okay now here is a map of the united states do you see this georgia is right here see it right there florida is right here the gulf of mexico is here the atlantic coastal plain is here and the state of georgia is here the Nez Perce lived right up here, where the uh, where Idaho, Oregon, and Washington are in this high country right here. So I'm gonna take my marker right now, and I'm gonna draw a big star so we can remember. Okay, right here. Whoop, 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 whoop. So you can clearly identify where the star is. That is approximately where you would find the Nez Perce Native American tribe. Okay. Now to the uh, to the even further west of the Nez Perce, you'd find the Kwakiutl, where Vancouver uh, were, north of the Nez Perce, way, way north. In the Arctic Circle, you'd find the Inuit. Uh, and then south, you'd find the Hopi. So right here, this is where the Nez Perce lived, in the northwest part of the United States, but further south than uh, the Kwakiutl. So let's throw this up on our map. And okie dokie. Okay, so we have our map. This is the location where the Nez Perce lived. Let's talk about the legacy of the um, Nez Perce. <clears throat> so what happened is, is you know, this Native American tribe lived pretty much undisturbed for thousands of years until the United States started growing and growing and growing. And then in the 1800s, when Thomas Jefferson was president of the United States, uh, there was this big idea in the United States called Manifest Destiny. And what Manifest Destiny, the big idea about that was, is that the United States was growing and that it needed to grow west. One problem, 
there was conflict with many a Native American that were living, that were already living in the United States. They were first Americans. They were Native Americans. The word native means first. They're, they're here first. And so you had these people that were coming into the United States and they were telling uh, Nez Perce Native Americans, well, you need to keep on moving to the West because this is now our land. And so when Thomas Jefferson uh, purchased the Louisiana Purchase from France and Napoleon Bonaparte, um, explorers such as Lewis and Clark, uh, in conjunction with Sac uh, Sacagawea, uh, moved west, and they, you know, and they confronted uh, many a Nez Perce Native American on their way west, and um, there were, you know, there were conflict. There was, uh, you know, opportunities of uh, there were situations where there's cooperation as well. That's where you work together. But um, they faced a, a rough time in the 1800s and, and further on, when uh, especially in the 1840s and 1850s with the gold rush. Uh, many uh, miners and, I guess, explorers were moving out west trying to search for gold. In the process, there were many conflicts with Native Americans, especially the Nez Perce, because the Native the Nez Perce uh, believed that it was their land that they were searching for gold on, and, you know, it, it developed a sense of conflict. So there were many uh, battles, uh, you know, uh, just little scrimmages, little scrumishes, whatever you want to call them, just a lot of fighting going on. And so the legacy of the Nez Perce, they're still around, still proud of, the, of their heritage, proud of their culture, uh, and you can read a lot about it on the internet, um, but there's no doubt about it that in the 1800s, ne uh, Nez Perce culture uh, and their identity was uh, undoubtedly shaken with westward expansion uh, and it is really sad to talk about, but it's also pertinent information. It's really important because the Nez Perce say if the you know if if the people never you know moved from England from uh, Europe to North America, the Nez Perce still may be you know in numbers of thousands, uh, tens thousands, tens of thousands in the area. But because of westward expansion, because of, uh, you know, the gold rush of the 1840s, uh, especially in California, but moving, you know, uh, in the Northwest, um, there were many conflicts and the Nez Perce suffered because of it. So it's sad, but the Nez Perce has a culture that can be celebrated. And we're proud today to talk about the food, clothing, shelter, and location of the Nez Perce. And that is all we have for this lesson. And so I am glad that we can share this time together. I'm glad that we talked about those four things. And if you can explain this and locate the Nez Perce, if you can explain the food, clothing, and shelter, and you can locate the Nez Perce on a map, you have mastered the fourth grade social studies standard. And I would be very, very proud of you. So I'm gonna give you a high five right now. Boom! And I am going to holler at you later. All right, this is Mr. Horton, also known as Bowtie Guy. Peace.